Hello, and welcome back to Indie Book Talk. Today, we have Tara Platt. We were joking earlier about how sometimes I have to have people pronounce names, but hers is good. I've got this one. Tara is an actor. She's a writer. She's an entrepreneur. She's given a TEDx talk. She's a voiceover actor who's written about voiceover things. We're going to talk about that. But we're also going to ask her about her new YA novel, Prep School for Serial Killers, about which Shelly is very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you guys welcome. so much. I'm really, really thrilled to be chatting with you guys today. Now, as much as I want to jump in and talk about serial killers, we'll start with the TEDx talk. So what did you talk about in your TEDx? Our talk, just so you know, in full disclosure, wasn't just me giving the TED talk. I actually did it with my husband, who is also an actor in his own right, very successful. Um, We were approached to give a talk on storytelling. That was sort of the overarching kind of idea behind what our talk was going to be. And when they do TEDx talks, they often give you uh, a sort of vague topic in the sense that like we were using storytelling to be how we got into our topic, but our topic was when bubbles burst. Um, And so we took the idea, the concept of when bubbles burst, what does that mean? It means things don't go according to plan. You might feel upset or devastated or what does that all mean to you? And so we took all those elements and we kind of rolled them in a ball. Um, We've been married for quite some time. It'll be 21 years uh, at the end of this year. And uh, we are both actors and we are both writers and we are producers. We have our own publishing company and our own production company. And at the root of it, we regard ourselves as just storytellers because it doesn't really matter what format or what medium we're participating in we just have stories inside of us or want to help other people tell their stories like when we're actors we show up and we help somebody else's story come to life but when we write or when we produce or when we create we're telling our own stories and so we're like well we're storytellers so how can we use the idea and concept of storytelling and apply it to this idea of moments in your life when bubbles burst And it was very quick for both of us to sort of disseminate, like so many TED Talks have already been out there of how to overcome trauma and what you should do and things like that. And we're like, well, we want to bring our own flavor to the table. And so we looked at it and we're like, well, in storytelling, there is this wonderful Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And you may love it, you may hate it, but it is very recurrent as a theme in many forms of writing and literature and storytelling across many cultures. There's there's a recurring quality of you have a character that goes on some sort of journey and they change based on what happens to them. And there's ups and there's downs and they have people that help them and, and enemies that thwart them. And there, there's sort of these recurring things that happen. And so we took that idea and we said, okay, If we're storytellers and we have this big event in our life, whatever it is, and we feel like we're in crisis, what if we applied that idea of the hero's journey to our crisis and figure out how we're able to work from there? And so that's actually what our TED Talk was about, was taking storytelling and sort of turning the lens on yourself as if a writer, a great writer were writing your story of whatever was going on. You lost your job or you broke up with somebody or... (laughs) you lost somebody or whatever is happening and then chart how you can move through those various stages. Um, you know, the call to action and the, the working and, and building your team and mm-hmm. the, the dark night of the soul, like all those various steps and elements that happy, happen in storytelling. Where are you in the journey and how can that help you move through it and move past it and get the help that you need? And so that was actually something that we we talked about. And then it was interesting because it came into play when I was actually writing this book. Um, I had written the book as part of, uh, I'm sure you guys know about NaNoWriMo and NaPoWriMo, yes. the National Novel Writing Month and the National Poetry Writing Month. And I had done NaPoWriMo on sort of a whim. And I was like, oh, well, I'll try a different style of poetry each day. And then the ones I really like, I'll go back to and I'll, I'll dabble and I'll do a sonnet and then I'll do, you know, a, a haiku. And so I just played with it when I did it. And then after I had done it and I had so much fun and very low stakes and consequences because no one really cared if I was doing it or I wasn't. I was just doing it on my own. I was like, oh, next year I'll do NaNoWriMo. Mm-hmm. And then November showed up and I was like, oh my God, it's November. I got to do NaNoWriMo. And so I just sat down and sort of every day I wrote and I got this novel. I sort of got a a vomit draft of a novel and then I didn't know what to 
do. I didn't know how to move forward. I didn't know what to do with it. So I threw it in the drawer and just forgot about it until we did our TED Talk and we needed some examples of being in crisis and that it isn't always big crisis. Sometimes it's small crisis. And so the small crisis we used as an example was I'm just stuck. Like, I don't know how to move forward. I have a manuscript for a book, but I know it's not good yet because it's just the vomit draft, but I don't know what to do. And we actually, on stage, we went through the various examples and we used my example to show like, where am I in the story structure? And, oh, I need to build a team. And that means I probably should get an editor. And so we used it as our example. And I never thought about it, but then I got a whole bunch of comments and questions from people like, so what are you doing with your story and what's happening with your story? And tell me more. And then I got a little fire under my butt and I had to go actually do it. <laughs> so, um, so yes, so the TED Talk actually leads me into my book because it, it forced me to get onto my team building and, and get out there at my call to, my, my call to action and, and go on the journey of making a book. That might be my favorite book origin story we've heard, Shelley. <laughs> well, so I was doing a TED Talk and it just became a book. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of that meme. Your talk reminds me of that meme where it says, uh, if something goes wrong, just yell plot twist and move on. Yes. And yes. I, it's like the abridged version. Yes. Yes. Plot yeah. twist. And then hope <laughs> nobody sees all the smoke that you've thrown down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't look over here wait, exactly, uh, exactly. what's behind you <laughs> look over there so um you had this book you then were forced by strangers who heard your ted talk to yes. cr- turn this book into a actual book yeah. what what was that process like how did you how did you find your way along that path Yeah, that was really eye-opening. Since I had written it without an outline and without it really any plan and not actually thinking anyone in the world was going to read it, um, there were a lot of holes and there were a lot of um, foibles for me as a writer because I hadn't plotted it out. I hadn't figured out things. I had just sort of each day forced myself to write. And so when I went back to it after having it, you know, sitting in the drawer for a couple of years, and having a child and then being like, okay, now, now I actually have to do something because people know about it. Um, First, I just sort of like read through it and tried to figure out the pieces that I actually still liked Mm -hmm. and where I thought the truth and the grain of the story was because I hadn't figured that out. I was just sort of throwing words on the page with things that made me excited or interested or intrigued or curious. And then my story happens to have a mystery in it. And of course, you can't accidentally make up a mystery. Like you have to sort of, it's a way you have to like know who done it, right? Like you, you can't just be like, no, oh, I, I don't know who did it. You know, as a writer, like it's great for the audience. They don't know it's coming, but like you better have it figured out if you're the author. Um, and so then when I was in my team building, I found a great editor and she was great at helping read through what I had written along with me and saying, this doesn't make any sense. This is great, but you need to flesh this out more. This doesn't make any sense. Is this actually what you're trying to say? And then I would get clear and be like, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. And this is what I'm trying to say. And I really had to tug on the threads of what the story needed to be um, and get honest with throwing some of the baby out with the bathwater and being like, okay, that was fun, but this actually isn't serving the story and get kind of, you know, like brutal with, you know, cuts and then writing a whole bunch more and putting that in there. And um, then it again went in the drawer for a little while because once again, even though I had gotten to that step, I still got a little, you know, nervous because I don't consider myself an author, even though I've written several things. And then it took me hitting the pandemic and being like, okay, what am I actually doing with this? Like I've got a, I've already invested so much work into building it and then going back and working on it. Now what? And then she was off having children and she's like, I can't help you right now. And I was like, cool, cool. I'll find some help. <laughs> and then I found another great editor and we went from there. And I just, I kept sort of like pulling on threads and then being like tugging with the story, like playing tug of war with my own story and being like, that doesn't work. This works. How do I fix this? How do I amend it? How do I make everything actually tie up in a little bow kind of at the end? And uh, so that was kind of the process for me. But but writing with an outline would have been 
so much more helpful if I had just done that from the very beginning. <laughs> no, you can just wing those. That's that's good. We, we so know nothing those, about this. <laughs> were those both developmental editors? Yes. Uh, okay. So those two were my developmental editors. And then at the very end of the process, once they sort of had gotten through that sort of story editing, mm-hmm. then I did have my line editor come in and sort of like polish everything nice and neat, sort of. <laughs> now, now that you've done Nano, are you going to do it again? I don't know if I will do Nano specifically. I do. I love it as a concept and I love that it like lit the fire underneath me and and got me to where I am right now because I know that if I hadn't had that as an an incentive and sort of a goal that I probably wouldn't have actually sat down and written it Mm -hmm. but especially and I don't know if it's because I'm older than I was when this started and I have a kid and there's so many things in life it would be very hard for me to try to stay on the same schedule that I sort of gave myself Um, just because there are definitely some days in my life where I'm like, I can't do anything. (laughs) Like I got to take care of all this other stuff that doesn't revolve around me or my interests or my career or anything like that. I've got to take care of family things just to make life happen for all the heads in my my house that, um, I don't know if it would be the way that I would write again, but I, I am still writing. I'm in fact, I got so many people after the book came out, they're like, when's the sequel? I was like, oh, you guys want a sequel? Um, I should figure that out and so then like I sat down and I actually was like I'm gonna write an outline so then I wrote an outline and now I'm now I'm slowly writing on it but um it's not it's not as it's not as fast and easy as it was the first time because I just I didn't have anything else to do with my time but do what I wanted to do and now I'm a mom so gotcha okay so to the book serial killers let's talk serial killers so Tell me all about prep school for serial killers. <laughs> how no, do you join? Yes, 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 how you can join the school. Um, I think it came out of a couple different kernels of ideas that, of course, I hadn't gotten clear on because I just sat down and like I just started saying, oh, I like this character. And, oh, what if she's a murderer? And like I, I was just playing with things that fascinated me or intrigued me or got me a little excited. And then I kind of had to build a story around that. Like, why would she have these skills? Oh, maybe because she's training to be an assassin or, you know, like, so I just, I threw things on the page and then kept what stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the world that I have now crafted and, and sort of polished from the very first beginnings of the ideas, uh, this is a world post, post, post war. So it's as if our world, a couple hundred years down the line um, and the planet has been ravaged. Things are not going well for humanity. And unfortunately, the various governments that still have a, a hold on society don't know how to control the populace or at least get the populace to do what they want. And so mm-hmm. they inadvertently poison everyone with a thing that's supposed to make everyone calm and happy, but instead actually removes empathy and connectivity therefore creating an entire society of people who fall on the behavioral scale of like psychopaths, which is why they now have schools that are training schools for these kids that test very high on the psychopathic disorder scale of showing that they would be able to kill people because the government still wants to control them rather than them running rampant and doing what they want. And um, so it's a really fun place to play in, but it also caused a couple pitfalls because if you have a character that's lacking empathy and connectivity, it's very hard for your reader or your audience to be able to feel connected to them. And so I definitely had to find ways to make my main character anathema enjoyable enough that, that you see her arc and her growth and you actually care about what's going to happen to her and where she's coming from so that you don't just sort of feel like, well, I don't care about any of these people. They're just a bunch of murderers. Like you, you still need to, to be invested in them and their story. Yeah, that's hard when you don't you particularly care for the main character because of what they do. So give an example of something maybe you did to help. Yes. So when I first wrote the book, I had my entire population sort of testing on the scale and lacking empathy. But I quickly realized that when everyone just naturally is that way, it is very difficult to have any kind of emotional scene. (laughs) And yes, you can have dramatic things happen, but like how to get invested is very difficult. 
So I actually had to change it a, a little bit in story points where, yes, this polyzone had been like put into the water supply of everyone. So everyone was in, ingesting it, but it mm-hmm. affected people slightly differently. And so they at the school, at these boarding schools, which are all around the country, um, where they're training these kids, they are still given vitamins, which are actually various compounds of of chemicals to keep them still in that place of very submissive, but very focused and very not connected or reactive. And you actually, I had to chart through the book once anathema realizes what's going on and maybe decides to stop taking those pills, how that affects her reactions to things and observations of things and her behavior, how that changes, how she becomes, for lack of a better better term, more human, like how Mm -hmm. she deals with becoming emotional, like the emotional um, blossoming of her character, like how that, how that actually comes into play. You see through the cold, direct way that she relates to things at the beginning and then how she starts to you know like what is this wetness coming from my eyes like I, what's happening to me you know having her have those moments where she's actually starting to find her own humanity and how that feels to her and how she responds to it her choices that kind of reminds me of the giver in a way yes yeah that, that kind of like opening up to all of what humanity is and not being contained to just one narrow channel. Yeah. I really like that. That's, yeah. I kind of want to read it now. Yeah. <laughs> I should have read it before also, we did think, this. What I think is really interesting is, and maybe it's just me where I am in my life, but recognizing that we all of us have a rainbow of colors of emotions in our bodies and our, and our, and our, our feelings. And there aren't good emotions and bad emotions. There's just a variety of them. Because often when I was younger, like if I didn't feel happy, I wasn't feeling good. Like I needed to have these positive thoughts and feelings all the time or something was wrong with me. And now I can more fully embrace like, yeah, I get angry and I get I get disappointed and I get frustrated. Like I have all these other things that I used to sort of color code into like good and bad sort of categories. And no, we all have a wide gamut of things that we feel. And if even one person can read the story and and open up how they feel a little bit, that's great. You know, like this idea that we have room to change and explore and grow and that they're not bad. They're just there. It's just like the trees on the, the leaves on the tree are just leaves on the tree. It doesn't mean that those leaves that are brown are, be- are worse than the green leaves. They're just different leaves. So, okay. so I'm, I'm going to just like pivot us way off the completely different direction because I don't know if those of you who are watching this on YouTube, in the edit, you may not be able to see this, but in the background, I'm seeing something, something detective agency on your door. Is that your recording? space it is, it is so uh my husband and i do a lot of voiceover work that's what we're primarily known for this is this is our booth this is the booth ah. um but because we don't want to just a big block in the middle of the room we tried to decorate it and so you can't actually see it because of where the camera is but it says lowenthal and platt detective agency established that is awesome. 2001 because we got married in 2001 so like we're, we're a little silly so i gave that to him actually as an anniversary present i mean just the the image of the thing to stick on the door. We already had the booth. That was not an anniversary present. That would be a weird anniversary present. I did give them a like, little uh, decal to stick on the booth just because I thought it was fun. And we love, I mean, like we love noir. We love old black and white Hollywood movies. Like we love all that stuff. And we love detective stories, which is probably why I have a mystery in mind because I do love that that exploration that a character can go through when they're discovering something and figuring something mm-hmm. out. I always think that there's something really fun, whether or not it's a full on whodunit murder mystery, just this idea of like, I need to get to the bottom of this. I need to understand it because that in a way sort of is who I am in the world. Like if I don't understand something, I go read and research about it because I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to know mm-hmm. why it does that. I want to know why that works or doesn't work. And so I think my, my characters inherently come with that preloaded because it's me (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome so if we we could talk to you a lot longer because there's whole topics we haven't even got to um like voiceover actor the voiceover voice actor book right Mm -hmm. that's right Mm -hmm. um but 
we're going to let other people do that discovery themselves. So tell us where they can find you online so they can hunt down all the awesome things you've done Absolutely. and keep up with your projects. I am fairly easily found on the internet, on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Tara Platt, which is just my name. And I think on TikTok, which I don't do very often, but I think it's the Tara Platt. And you can find my website, taraplatt.com. You see the theme, right? I just use my name over and over again. I like um, it. Branded also, it completely if you're well. you're curious <laughs> about the production company that Yuri and I have or the publishing company that Yuri and I have, we do have sort of a main cash website, which is called Monkey Mayhem Hub. And from there, you can get to either Monkey Kingdom Productions, which is our production company, or Bugbot Press, which is our publishing company. And you can see our various titles where you'll see the other books that we've done and you'll see the movies and the web series and shorts that we've done and the comic books and stuff like that. Fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to go look at that yes. uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone go check that out. Um, Tara's done all kinds of amazing things. Her husband has done all kinds of amazing things. They're both amazing. And uh, there's a lot of stuff to explore. Um, I, I need to go read your book now. I've, you've just given me so many things to do. Okay. Well, thank you. Tell her to now write the second book. Get on. Oh, that. yes. And write oh. the second book because. I, I am working on it. I am okay. working on it. And You're going to get an email from me comments. in like two days where I'm, where I'm going to be like. Tara, where's the next book? I finished the exactly, first one. Exactly. Well, that's what was happening with everyone after the TED Talk. I was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, Tara. It was a pleasure to so have you. Me about it. I'm very excited.